morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sam. For anyone who doesn't know me, I have, I have the privilege, the gift, the blessing of serving as under shepherd here to the Good Shepherd. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm really excited for today. But yeah, yeah, I know I'm really excited, right? You guys made me a shirt. Um, here's the thing: like, who who gets excited on Easter morning? Yeah, Amen, right? Who gets excited on June 17th? Who gets excited on November 3rd? Jesus is risen on those days. So the excitement that you feel today, take it with you, please. 365 days of the year. Uh, but we're going to look at this morning some of the imagery that we associate with Easter. Um, I was talking with a friend recently, just this past week, and, and we were discussing the nature of church and the purpose of church, and the, the point of church, and, uh, and by church, we're referring to the church service. We know that church is the body of people, the ecclesia, but we're referring to the service, the gathering, and he asked a really good question. You know, he, he phrased it this way. He said, where is the gaze of the worshiper? I, I think that's a question that congregations need to ask themselves and answer. Where is the gaze of the worshiper? And so that's what we're going to look at this morning. Before we dive in, please join me in prayer. Lord, thank you for good news. God, if, if the news that Jesus died and was resurrected and reigns is not good, then nothing is worthy of being called good. So thank you for the good news that we celebrate today. May we celebrate it every day. Uh, Lord, we do recognize that on this, on this Easter Sunday, it does feel special. And so thank you that you use times like this to remind us that we shouldn't take it for granted, that we should celebrate, we should rejoice. So Lord, may that be what happens in this time as we continue to worship through engaging with your word, as we continue to worship and using our minds that you gave us. May you be glorified. May all of this bring praise to Jesus and Jesus alone. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Easter. The imagery of Easter. I'm not talking about, you know, the commercial imagery. Uh, I'm talking about when we think of Easter from a biblical, faith-based perspective, what are the images that come to mind? What are the images? When I searched for Easter slide templates, right, what pictures were on 95% of the slides? The cross. And what's the other one up there? The tomb. Great imagery. Wonderful things to keep in mind. But what I'm about to say, stick with me, we're going to look at this. Don't look at either of those expecting to see Jesus there. Okay? Don't, don't look at the cross and expect to see Jesus there. Don't look at the tomb and expect to see Jesus there. Now look at the cross, look at the tomb, but realize what we're going to see when we look there. And so we're going to read through the Easter story. We're going to be in Matthew 27 uh, at different points throughout this, if anybody wants to read along. But we're going to look at the Easter story, and we're going to remind ourselves of where we should look expecting to see Jesus. So this is in Matthew 27, and I'll be starting in verse 22. Jesus had been brought before uh, Pilate, the judge, the boss, and he said to the crowd, hey, you know, at Easter, at this time, at this time of the year, during this, it wasn't called Easter then, but during this time of the year, we release one prisoner. I propose to release Jesus because I find no wrongdoing in him. And the crowd isn't having it. And so we find ourselves in verse 22. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. 
And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. When they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gal. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, when, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribe and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling to Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. Look to the cross. Absolutely, friends. But don't expect to see Jesus there. The story doesn't end with Jesus left on the cross. The story doesn't end with his body hanging up, crucified. So when we look to the cross, when we look to this horrible, painful instrument of torture that God redeemed. I mean, you want to talk about imagery of redemption? We've shared this detail before, but let me remind you, Roman law forbade Roman citizens from being crucified because it was too horrific of an experience. They were like, no, we won't do this to our own people because of how bad it is. God took this horrible excruciating, excruciating, excrucio. We literally get the word for the most intense pain imaginable from out of crucifixion. God took this torture instrument and turned it into a symbol of redemption, turned it into a symbol of salvation. But when we look to the cross, remember that it's empty. So what should the empty cross remind us? That Jesus' power is greater than sin's grip. Be encouraged when you look and see an empty cross. Romans 3, or Romans 6, verse 3, verses 6 to 7, and verses 10 to 11. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you all must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. 
2 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 16. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 5 Verse 21 and 7 verse 1, For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Galatians 2, 20 and 5, 1, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look to the cross. I'm not saying don't. I'm saying Scripture reminds me that I'm not going to see Jesus still on the cross. I'm going to see sin defeated. I'm going to see the power of sin, the slave chains of sin, broken. I'm going to see a reminder that I have been set free. That the old self is dead. Well, I'm just an impatient person. I'm just an angry person. I'm... No, no, that person died. The cross is empty. The sin lost its claim. That's what looking at the cross should remind us of. The emptiness of it. The emptiness of the claim of sin. Where did we leave Jesus in Matthew 27? When it was evening, Joseph of Arimathea comes and says, hey, let me bury the body. And so the body is buried. Resuming in Matthew 27, verse 62. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by stealing the stone and setting a guard. Now after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Look to the tomb. Absolutely. I'm not saying ignore the tomb. But don't look to the tomb and expect to see Jesus. Don't look to the tomb and expect to see the stone before the entrance. If you look at the tomb, you're going to see the same thing we see on the cross. Emptiness. Jesus isn't there. Amen. So when we look to the empty tomb, what should we see? What should we be reminded of? What does God's Word say? It reminds us that death has no claim on us. The top two fears almost every year are public speaking and dying. Which tells me a lot of us don't understand how simple public speaking is. But dying, we're afraid of dying. The world is terrified to die. Why? Well, because is that it? Is that the end? That's a scary thing. I don't know what to make of this. No, for the Christian, death's not scary. Honestly, for the Christian, death is, 
it's one of the best things that can happen to us. That's when we'll really be alive. That's when we'll really start to live. That's when we'll see Jesus face to face. Because He's not in the tomb. Listen to these verses. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. 1 Corinthians 15, 20-23, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then in his coming, those who belong to Christ. Ephesians 2, 4-7, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So look at the tomb. Look at a picture of the tomb. Focus on the emptiness. Recognize the emptiness of the tomb and be joyful remembering that death has no claim on us. That we live forever with Jesus. All right. So I threw that question out there at the beginning. Imagery of Easter. We answered the cross and the tomb. And then I went and rudely said, well, we're not going to see Jesus at either of those two places. Your answers were still good. So where are we going to see Jesus? Where do we see Jesus? Man, we see Him on the throne. We see the King on the throne. That's where Jesus is. Consider these verses. Hebrews 1.8, But of the Son, God says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. Hebrews 10.12-13, But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until His enemies should be made a footstool for His feet. Jesus is on the throne. And that throne is not budging. That throne is not affected by what goes on in this world. The trials, the tribulations, the things that cause us panic, the things that cause us fear, the things that steal our joy, the things that kill our passion. Jesus' place on the throne is not touched by those things. Because on the throne, Jesus is sovereign. Jesus was sovereign. Don't get me wrong. Jesus was sovereign when He was incarnate. Jesus has always been sovereign, always will be sovereign. When we look to the throne, we are reminded of this. When we look to the throne, we are reminded that victory is certain. Who was here for the week where we looked at how the Psalms remind us of hope? What is hope? Hope is certainty. Hope is 100%. Hope is guaranteed. That's biblical hope. Hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is not, I want this to happen, but I don't really know. No, hope is, yeah, 100%, done deal, happening, guaranteed. The throne reminds us of this. The throne reminds us of victory. It reminds us there's no condemnation for the believer. There's no fear for the believer. Consider Romans 8, 1-4. to There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Empty cross, empty tomb. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Hebrews 7, 23-26 The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But Jesus holds His priesthood permanently because He continues forever. 
Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Listen to this. I mean, listen to this ending of verse 25. He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. One of the things that Jesus is doing on his throne is interceding for us. That's, that's incredible. That, that is, that is mind-blowing. We have an enemy. We've talked about this. We've talked about the reality of our enemy. One of his names is the accuser. The accuser of God's children. It was a legal term, right? The lawyer trying to get you in trouble. Jesus is the one interceding for us. And Jesus wins that argument because he says, no, my blood purchased their righteousness. Jesus is on the throne. That's where we see Christ. I mean, honestly, church, what, what are we afraid of? What are we waiting for? What holds us back? My king's on the throne. Victory is guaranteed. Why are we not charging into battle? Why are we not waking up with a zeal that is unrivaled by anything else? Our king's not on the cross. Our king's not in the tomb. Our king is alive and victorious. Amen. You don't want to be a part of that? You don't want to be a part of that Super Bowl parade? You don't want to be a part of that charge on the battlefield? You don't want to be on the front lines fighting forward, following Jesus? Friends, he's on the throne. So look to the cross. Look to the cross and remember, ah, I'm set free from the slavery of, chain, of sin. Look to the tomb. Look to the tomb and remember, I'm set free from the fear of death. I'm set free from the penalty of sin, and then look to the throne and see our Lord and say, all right, let's go. Let's do this. Because that's where Jesus is. That's where I want my gaze to be fixed. If you're here and you're saved, hallelujah, praise God, I cannot wait to spend eternity with you in festal celebration. Let this next part remind you of the beauty of that. If you're here and you're still afraid of death because you don't know what's on the other side, if you're joining us online and you're like, mm, I'm not so sure I'm as excited about death as he is. I don't know what's going to happen to me when I die. This whole thing of hope, guaranteed hope, certainty of hope, I don't have that. Please, I don't care what preconceived notions you have. Please listen to this part. And please come talk to me afterwards. If you're intimidated to come up to the guy who's on stage, then grab the nearest person to you and say, hey, you talk to me about what he said. If they can't, then just keep grabbing people until somebody can. I, I promise you, this is news that you cannot afford to ignore. This is a component of your life that you can't afford to say, well, I'll figure it out later. We don't know when later is. We know that Jesus is on the throne today. Amen. And we know that he offers this certainty of victory to us. Consider Acts 3.19. Repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. We talked about the emptiness of the cross, the defeat of the power of sin, the defeat of the slavery of sin. I feel stuck in this cycle. I feel stuck in this behavior I don't want to be in. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Romans 10, 9, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. 
Guaranteed. Promised. The Lord who spoke all of this into existence. That's what He lays out. Acts 10.43, all the prophets, everyone who came before bears witness that everyone who believes in Jesus receives forgiveness of sins through His name. And it's through His name alone. This isn't a multiple pass to the top of the mountain. This isn't a you do you, I'll do me, we'll both get there together. No, salvation's found in Jesus alone. No other choices. You can't earn it. I don't care how good your work ethic is. I don't, you put in 80 hours a week, good for you. You're not going to earn your way to heaven. You look at 80 hours a week and you're like, man, that guy's slacking off. I put in 120. Good for you. You're still not going to earn your way into heaven. I don't care how much good you do. I don't care how much you give to charity. I don't care how much you serve. You cannot earn your way into salvation. Jesus and Jesus alone. And it's freely offered. Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death. We earn death. I earned the cross, 100%. I, I bought my way to the cross a million times over. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what that means for you if you're here, if you're joining online and you don't know where you stand eternally, it's a repentance. It's a confession of sin. It's a, it's a turning from sin. It's a declaration that Jesus is Lord. It's a belief that He is the only way to salvation. And then it's joy. Then it's hope. Then it's peace. Then it's no condemnation. Then it's, let's go fight, because I know we win. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So please, look to the cross, look to the tomb, but don't let your eyes stop there. Make sure that we always end. What's Colossians say? Seek the things that are above. What's Hebrews say? We lift our eyes and we look to Jesus. Don't stop at the empty cross. Don't stop at the empty tomb. Set our eyes on the occupied throne. Please join me in prayer. Lord, ah, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for these reminders. Lord, may, may the takeaway not be that the cross and the tomb are to be trivialized and forgotten. Remind us of the significance of those two. Remind us of the impact of the cross, the impact of the tomb. Lord, and then help us lift our eyes to the throne. Fill your church with a zeal for you, with a holy fire, with a passion, with a burden. Lord, sin is real, death is real, and that should fill your people with a drive to see that no one experiences that death. Make us holy. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Sorrows lay on my heart by his own betrayal. The sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus' name. as he Stood accused, beaten by death's cold, bowing to the Father's will, he took a crown of thorns. Oh, that rug.
rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor unto thee. Set a heaven, God's own Son, to purchase and redeem, and reconcile the My salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, Hallelujah, praise and honor unto thee. Now my dead is paid, it is paid. The precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, he's free indeed. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus. Still, now the curse of sin has no hold on me. The sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out. Hallelujah, praise and honor unto Thee. See, the stone is rolled away. Behold the empty tomb. Hallelujah, God be. He's risen from the grave. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor. going to struggle with sin. We're going to be tempted. We're going to fight. We're still going to wrestle with fear. But it doesn't have victory over us. It doesn't have claim over us. So the amens that we shouted out this morning, the claps that we gave this morning, the smiles and the head nods this morning, man, say amen tomorrow. Clap and smile and nod a month from now. Because remember that He is risen. Hey everyone, Pastor Sam here. Thanks for joining us for a Sunday sermon. If you're interested in more of the sermons from this series or some of our past sermon series that we've done, you can find them at discovercommunity.org under the sermon file. Uh, otherwise, you can subscribe to this channel to make sure you stay up to date on all our content. Thanks for joining us.